This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bleak House by Charles Dickens, Chapter 10 The Law Writer. On the eastern borders of Chancery Lane, that is to say, more particularly in Cook's Court, Cursitor Street, Mr. Snagsby, law stationer, pursues his lawful calling. In the shade of Cook's Court, at most times a shady place, Mr. Snagsby has dealt in all sorts of blank forms of legal process, in skins and rolls of parchment, in paper, full scap, brief, draft, brown, white, whitey brown, and blotting, in stamps, in office quills, pens, ink, India rubber, pounce, pins, pencils, sealing wax, and wafers, in red tape and green ferret, in pocket books, almanacs, diaries, and law lists, in string boxes, rulers, inkstands, glass and leaden, pen knives, scissors, bodkins, and other small office cutlery, in short, in articles too numerous to mention, ever since he was out of his time and went into partnership with Peffer. On that occasion, Cook's Court was in a manner revolutionized by the new inscription in fresh paint, Peffer and Snagsby, displacing the time-honored and not easily to be deciphered legend, Peffer only. For smoke, which is the London ivy, had so wreathed itself round Peffer's name and clung to his dwelling-place that the affectionate parasite quite overpowered the parent tree. Peffer is never seen in Cook's court now. He is not expected there, for he has been recumbent this quarter of a century in the churchyard of St. Andrew's, Holborn, with the wagons and hackney coaches roaring past him all the day and half the night like one great dragon. If he ever steal forth when the dragon is at rest, to air himself again in Cook's court, until admonished to return by the crowing of the sanguine cock in the cellar at the little dairy in Cursitor Street, whose ideas of daylight it would be curious to ascertain, since he knows from his personal observation next to nothing about it. If Peffer ever do revisit the pale glimpses of Cook's court, which no law stationer in the trade can positively deny, he comes invisibly, and no one is the worse or wiser. In his lifetime, and likewise in the period of Snagsby's time of seven long years, there dwelt with Peffer in the same law stationary premises a niece, a short, shrewd niece, something too violently compressed about the waist, with it, and with a sharp nose like a sharp autumn evening, inclining to be frosty toward the end. The cook's courtiers had a rumor flying among them that the mother of this niece did, in her daughter's childhood, moved by too jealous a solicitude that her figure should approach perfection, lace her up every morning with her maternal foot against the bedpost for a stronger hold and purchase, and further that she exhibited internally pints of vinegar and lemon juice, which acids they held had mounted to the nose and temper of the patient. With whichsoever of the many tongues of rumour this frosty report originated, it either never reached or never influenced the ears of young Snagsby, who, having wooed and won its fair subject on his arrival at man's estate, entered into two partnerships at once. So now, in Cook's Court, Cursitor Street, Mr. Snagsby and the niece are one, and the niece still cherishes her figure, which, however tastes may differ, is unquestionably so far precious that there is mighty little of it. Mr. and Miss, Mrs. Snagsby are not only one bone and one flesh, but, to the neighbor's thinking, one voice, too. 
that voice appearing to proceed from mrs snagsby alone is heard in cook's court very often mr snagsby otherwise than as he finds expression through these dulcet tones is rarely heard he is a mild bald timid man with a shining head and a scrubby clump of black hair sticking out at the back he tends to meekness and obesity as he stands at his door in cook's court in his grey shop-coat and black calico sleeves looking up the clouds or stands behind a desk in his dark shop with a heavy flat ruler snipping and slicing at sheepskin in company with his two prentices he is emphatically a retiring and unassuming man from beneath his feet at such times as from a shrill ghost unquiet in its grave there frequently arise complainings and lamentations in the voice already mentioned and haply on some occasions when these reach a sharper pitch than usual mr snagsby mentions to the prentices i think my little woman is giving it to guster this proper name so used by mr snagsby has before now sharpened the wit of the cook's courtiers to remark that it ought to be the name of mrs snagsby seeing that she might with great force and expression be termed a guster in compliment to her stormy character it is however the possession and the only possession except fifty shillings per annum and a very small box indifferently filled with clothing of a lean young woman from a workhouse by some supposed to have been christened augusta who although she was farmed or contracted for during her growing time by an amiable benefactor of his species resident at tooting and cannot fail to have been developed under the most favourable circumstances has fits which the parish can't account for guster really aged three or four and twenty but looking around ten years older goes cheap with his unaccountable drawback of fits and is so apprehensive of being returned to the on the hands of her patron saint that except when she is found with her head in the pail or the sink or the copper or the dinner or anything else that happens to be near her at the time of her seizure she is always at work she is a satisfaction to the parents and guardians of the prentices who feel that there is little danger of her inspiring tender emotions in the breast of youth she is a satisfaction to mrs snagsby who can always find fault with her she is a satisfaction to mr snagsby who thinks it is a charity to keep her the law stationer's establishment is in guster's eyes a temple of plenty and splendor she believes the little drawing-room upstairs always kept as one may say with its hair in papers and its pinafore on to be the most elegant apartment in christendom the view it commands of cook's court at one end not to mention a squint into cursitor street and of coavinces the sheriff's officer's backyard at the other she regards as a prospect of unequalled beauty the portraits it displays in oil and plenty of it too of mr snagsby looking at mrs snagsby and of mrs snagsby looking at mr snagsby are in her eyes as achievements of raphael or titian guster has some recompenses for her many privations mr snagsby refers everything not in the practical mysteries of the business to mrs snagsby 
She manages the money, reproaches the tax-gatherers, appoints the times and places of devotion on Sundays, licenses Mr. Snagsby's entertainments, and acknowledges no responsibility as to what she thinks fit to provide for dinner, insomuch that she is the high standard of comparison among the neighboring wives, a long way down Chancery Lane on both sides, and even out in Holborn who, in any domestic passages of arms, habitually call upon their husbands to look at the difference between their, the wives, position, and Miss, Mrs. Snagsby's, and their, the husbands, behavior, and Mr. Snagsby's. Rumor always flying, bat-like, about Cook's Court, and skimming in and out of everybody's windows, does say that Mrs. Snagsby is jealous and inquisitive, and that Mr. Snagsby is sometimes worried out of house and home, and that if he had the spirit of a mouse he wouldn't stand it. It is even observed that the wives who quote him to their self-willed husbands as a shining example in reality look down upon him and that nobody does so with greater superciliousness than one particular lady whose lord is more than suspected of laying his umbrella on her as an instrument of correction. But these vague whisperings may arise from Mr. Snagsby's being, in his way, rather a meditative and poetical man, loving to walk in Staple Inn in the summer time and to observe how countrified the sparrows and the leaves are, also to lounge about the rolls yard of a Sunday afternoon, and to remark, if in good spirits, that there were old times once, and that you'd find a stone coffin or two now under that chapel. He'll be bound if you was to dig for it. He solaces his imagination, too, by thinking of the many chancellors and vices and masters of the rolls who are deceased, and he gets such a flavor of the country out of telling the two prentices how he has heard say that a brook as clear as crystal once ran right down the middle of Holborn, when turnstile really was a turnstile, leading slap away into the meadows, gets such a flavor of the country out of this that he never wants to go there. The day is closing in and the gas is lighted, but it is not yet fully effective, for it is not quite dark. Mr. Snagsby, standing at his shop door looking up at the clouds, sees a crow, who is out late, skim westward over the slice of sky belonging to Cook's Court. The crow flies straight across Chancery Lane and Lincoln's Inn Garden, into Lincoln's Inn Fields. Here, in a large house, formerly a house of state, lives Mr. Tulkinghorn. It is let off in sets of chambers now, and in those shrunken fragments of its greatness, lawyers lie like maggots in nuts. But its roomy staircases, passages, and antechambers still remain, and even its painted ceilings, where allegory in Roman helmet and celestial linen sprawls among balustrades and pillars, flowers, clouds, and big-leg boys, and makes the headache, as would seem to be allegory's object always, more or less. Here, among his many boxes labeled with transcendent names, lives Mr. Tulkinghorn, when not speechlessly at home in country houses where the great ones of the earth are bored to death. Here he is today, quiet at his table, an oyster of the old school, whom nobody can open. Like as he is to look at, so is his apartment in the dusk of the present afternoon. Rusty, out of date, withdrawing from attention, able to afford it heavy, broad-backed, old-fashioned mahogany and horsehair chairs, not easily lifted, obsolete tables with spindle legs and dusty baize covers, 
presentation prints of the holders of great titles in the last generation, or the last but one, environ him. A thick and dingy turkey carpet muffles the floor where he sits, attended by two candles in old-fashioned sil silver candlesticks that give a very insufficient light to his large room. The titles on the back of his books have retired into the binding. Everything that can have a lock has got one. No key is visible. Very few loose papers are about. He has some manuscript near him, but is not referring to it. With the round top of an inkstand and two broken bits of sealing wax, he is silently and slowly working out whatever train of indecision is in his mind. Now the inkstand top is in the middle. Now the red bit of sealing wax. Now the black bit. That's not it. Mr. Tulkinghorn must gather them all up and begin again. Here, beneath the painted ceiling, with foreshortened allegories staring down at his intrusion as if it meant to swoop upon him, and he cutting it dead, Mr. Tulkinghorn has at once his house and office. He keeps no staff, only one middle-aged man, usually a little out at elbows, who sits in a high pew in the hall and is rarely overburdened with business. Mr. Tulkinghorn is not in a common way. He wants no clocks. He is a great reservoir of confidences, not to be so tapped. His clients want him. He is all in all. Drafts that he requires to be drawn are drawn by special pleaders in the temple on mysterious instructions, fair copies that he requires to be made and are made at the stationer's expense being no consideration. The middle-aged man in the pew knows scarcely more of the affairs of the peerage than any crossing sweeper in Holborn. The red bit, the black bit, the inkstand top, the other inkstand top, the little sandbox. So, you to the middle, you to the right, you to the left, this train of indecision must surely be worked out now or never. Now, Mr. Tulkinghorn gets up, adjusts his spectacles, puts on his hat, puts the manuscript in his pocket, goes out, tells the middle-aged man out at elbows, I shall be back presently. Very rarely tells him anything more explicit. Mr. Tulkinghorn goes, as the crow came, not quite so straight, but nearly, to Cook's Court, Cursitor Street, to Snagby's, law stationers, deeds engrossed and copy, law writing executed in all his branches, etc., etc., etc. It is somewhere about five or six o'clock in the afternoon, and a balmy fragrance of warm tea hovers in Cook's Court. It hovers about Snagsby's door. The hours are early there, dinner at half-past one, and suff supper at half-past nine. Mr. Snagsby was about to descend into the subterranean regions to take tea when he looked out of his door just now and saw the crow who was out late. Master at home? Guster is minding the shop, for the prentices take tea in the kitchen with Mr. and Mrs. Snagsby. Consequently, the robe-maker's two daughters combing their curls at the two glasses in the two second-floor windows of the opposite house are not driving the two prentices to distraction, as they fondly suppose, but are merely awakening the unprofitable admiration of Guster, mm. whose hair won't grow and never would, and it is confidently thought never will. "'Master at home?' says Mr. Tulkinghorn. Master is at home, and Guster will fetch him. Guster disappears, glad to get out of the shop, which she regards with mingled dread and veneration as a storehouse of awful implements of the great torture of the law, a place not to be entered after the gas is turned off. Mr. Snagsby appears, greasy, warm, herbaceous, and chewing, 
bolts a bit of bread and butter, says, Bless my soul, sir, Mr. Tulkinghorn. I want half a word with you, Snagsby. Certainly, sir. Dear me, sir, why don't you send your young man round for me? Pray walk into the back shop, sir. Snagsby has brightened in a moment. The confined room, strong of parchment grease, is warehouse, counting house, and copying office. Mr. Tulkinghorn sits, facing round, on a stool at the desk. Jaundice and jaundice, Snagsby. Yes, sir, Mr. Snagsby turns up the gas and coughs behind his hand, modestly anticipating profit. Mr. Snagsby, as a timid man, is accustomed to cough with a variety of expressions, and so to save words. You copied some affidavits in that cause for me lately. Yes, sir, we did. There was one of them, says Mr. Tulkinghorn, carelessly feeling tight, open, unopenable oyster of the old school, in the wrong coat pocket, the handwriting of which is peculiar, and I rather like. As I happened to be passing, and thought I had it about me, I looked in to ask you, but I haven't got it. No matter. Any other time will do. Ah, here it is. I looked in to ask you who copied this. "'Who copied this, sir?' says Mr. Snagsby, taking it, laying it flat on the desk, and separating all the sheets at once with a twirl and a, tw and a twist of the left hand peculiar to law stationers. "'We gave this out, sir. We were giving out rather a large quantity of work just at that time. I can tell you in a moment who copied it, sir, by referring to my book.' Mr. Snagsby takes his book down from the safe, makes another bolt of the bit of bread and butter which seemed to have stopped short, eyes the affidavit aside, and brings his right forefinger travelling down a page of the book. Juby, Packer, Jarndyce. Jarndyce, here we are, sir, said Miss, says Mr. Snagsby. To be sure, I might have remembered it. This was given out, sir, to a writer who lodges just over on the opposite side of the lane. Mr. Tulkinghorn has seen the entry, found it before the law stationer, read it while the forefinger was coming down the hill. What do you call him? Nemo? says Mr. Tulkinghorn. Nemo, sir, here it is, forty-two folio, given out on the Wednesday night at eight o'clock, brought in on the Thursday morning at half after nine. Nemo, repeats Mr. Tulkinghorn, Nemo is Latin for no one. It must be English for someone, sir, I think, Mr. Snagsby submits with his deferential cough. It is a person's name. Here it is, you see, sir, forty-two folio, given out Wednesday night, eight o'clock, brought in Thursday morning, half after nine. The tail of Mr. Snagsby's eye becomes conscious of the head of Mrs. Snagsby looking in at the shop door to know what he means by deserting his tea. Mr. Snagsby addresses an exp explanatory cough to Mrs. Snagsby as who should say, my dear, a customer. Half after nine, sir, repeats Mr. Snagsby, our law writers, who live by job work, are a queer lot, and this may not be his name, but it's the name he goes by. I remember now, sir, that he gives it in a written advertisement. He sticks up down at the rule office and the king's bench office, and the judge's chambers, and so forth. You know the, know the kind of documents, sir, wanting employ. Mr. Tulkinghorn glances through the little window at the back of Covince's, the sheriff's officers, where lights shine in Covince's windows. Covince's coffee room is at the back, and the shadows of several gentlemen under a cloud loom cloudily upon the blinds. Mr. Snagsby 
takes the opportunity of slightly turning his head to glance over his shoulder at his little woman and to make apologetic motions with his mouth to this effect talking horn rich influential have you given this man work before asks mr talkinghorn oh dear yes sir work of yours thinking of more important matters i forgot where you said he lived across the lane sir in fact he lodges at a mr snagsby makes another bolt as if the bit of bread and butter were insurmountable at a rag and bottle shop can you show me the place as i go back with the greatest pleasure sir mr snagsby pulls off his sleeves and his gray coat pulls on his black coat and takes his hat from its peg oh here is my little woman he says aloud my dear will you be so kind as to tell one of the lads to look after the shop while i step across the lane with mr tulkinghorn mrs snagsby sir i shan't be two minutes my love mrs snagsby bends to the lawyer retires behind the counter peeps at them through the window blind goes softly into the back office refers to the entries in the book still lying open is evidently curious you will find that the place is rough sir says mr snagsby walking deferentially in the road and leaving the narrow pavement to the lawyer and the party is very rough but they're a wild lot in general sir the advantage of this particular man is that he never wants sleep he'll go at it right on end if you want him to as long as ever you like it is quite dark now and the gas lamps have acquired their full effect jostling against clerks going to post the day's letters and against counsel and attorneys going home to dinner and against plaintiffs and defendants and suitors of all sorts and against the general crowd in whose way the forensic wisdom of ages has interposed a million obstacles to the transaction of the commonest business of life diving through law and equity and through that kindred mystery the street mud which is made of nobody knows what and collects about us nobody knows whence or how we only know knowing in general that when there is too much of it we find it necessary to shovel it away the lawyer and the law stationer coming to a rag and bottle shop and general emporium of much disregarded merchandise lying and being in the shadow of the wall of lincoln's inn and kept as is announced in paint to all whom it may concern by one crook this is where he lives sir says the law stationer this is where he lives is it says the lawyer unconcernedly thank you are you not going in sir no thank you no i am going on to the fields at present good evening thank you mr snagsby lifts his hat and returns to his little woman and his tea but mr tulkinghorn does not go on to the fields at present he goes a short way turns back comes again to the shop of mr crook and enters it straight it is dim enough with a blot-headed candle or so in the windows and an old man and a cat sitting in the back part by a fire the old man rises and comes forward with another blot-headed candle in his hand pray is your lodger within male or female sir says mr crook male the person who does copying mr crook has eyed his man narrowly knows him by sight has an indistinct impression of his aristocratic repute do you wish to see him sir yes it's what i sell 
dum do myself says mr crook with a grin shall i call him down but it's a weak chance if he'd come sir i'll go up to him then says mr tulkinghorn second floor sir take the candle up there mr crook with his cat beside him stands at the bottom of the staircase looking after mr tulkinghorn hi hi he says when mr tulkinghorn has nearly disappeared the lawyer looks down over the handrail the cat expands her wicked mouth and snarls at him order lady jane behave yourself to visitors my lady you know what they say of my lodger whispers crook going up a step or two what do they say of him they say he has sold himself to the enemy but you and i know better he don't buy i'll tell you what though my lodger is so black-humoured and gloomy that i believe he'd as soon make that bargain as any other don't put him out sir that's my advice mr tulkinghorn with a nod goes on his way he comes to the dark door on the second floor he knocks receives no answer opens it and accidentally extinguishes his candle in doing so the air of the room is almost bad enough to have extinguished it if he had not it is a small room nearly black with soot and grease and dirt in the rusty skeleton of a grate pinched at the middle as if poverty had gripped it a red coke fire burns low in the corner by the chimney stands a deal table and a broken desk a wilderness marked with a rain of ink in another corner a ragged old portmanteau on one of the two chairs serves for a cabinet or wardrobe no larger one is needed for it collapses like the cheeks of a starved man the floor is bare except that one old mat trodden to shreds of rope yarn lies perishing upon the hearth no curtain veils the darkness of the night but the discoloured shutters are drawn together and through the two gaunt holes pierced in them famine might be staring in the banshee of the man upon the bed four on a low bed opposite the fire a confusion of dirty patchwork lean rib ticking and coarse sacking the lawyer hesitating just within the doorway sees a man he lies there dressed in shirt and trousers with bare feet he has a yellow look in the spectral darkness of a candle that has guttered down until the whole length of its wick still burning has doubled over and left a tower of winding sheet above it his hair is ragged mingled with his whiskers and his beard the latter ragged too and grown like the scum and mist around him in neglect foul and filthy as the room is foul and filthy as the air is it is not easy to perceive what fumes those are which most oppress the senses in it but through the general sickliness and faintness and the odor of stale tobacco there comes into the lawyer's mouth the bitter vapid taste of opium hello my friend he cries and strikes his iron candlestick against the door he thinks he has awakened his friend he lies a little turned away but his eyes are surely open hello my friend he cries again hello hello as he rattles on the door the candle which has drooped so long goes out and leaves him in the dark with the gaunt eyes in the shutters staring down upon the bed end of chapter ten